the number one reason that we find that people are in danger of workplace violence is a lack of understanding. I find that most people don't have a good understanding of workplace violence. They think it's the guy with the Uzi submachine gun or the rifle that comes in and blows up the McDonald's or the guy who wreaks havoc and shoots six or seven people at the post office. And yes, absolutely, that is a form of workplace violence, but it isn't what we see on a regular day-to-day -day basis. So I'm going to talk about all types of workplace violence today. Most of us identify with the shocking news titles that we see on TV and in newspapers. This does a couple things. It creates fear, and we start to think this is common. While these are certainly the most serious cases, the commonality that we see is that coworkers are really in denial. This couldn't possibly happen here. You know, our company is in such a nice neighborhood. I can't believe it could happen here. This is a quiet community. I can't believe it could happen here. He seemed like such a nice guy. This couldn't happen here. This kind of stuff only happens in California and New York. So we really build up a false sense of what workplace violence is, where it can be committed. We make these judgments very quickly. A lot of companies do domestic violence training, but they don't think it's a part of workplace violence. So while they do the training, they may not have policies and procedures in place. They may not relate it to violence in the workplace. A lot of spying is going on in corporate America these days. Uh, people who have access to privileged information when they get nervous, when they want to get back at the company, when there's a great fear in them, they will commit spying. We have hate crimes and racism, which is currently on the climb. One of the things that you may not have thought of is poisoning. And for any of you who are on the line that work in food manufacturing and food preparation, this is of great concern. You might remember the Colgate situation a few years back where there was a look-alike. It wasn't actually the Colgate company, but it was someone pretending to be Colgate, somebody who used to work for Colgate that was... Uh, wanting to get back at the company, and they made a small five-ounce travel size of toothpaste. The only thing was that there was poison inside of that toothpaste, and that began circulating all across uh, the con uh, many countries. It started, actually, it was made, they say, in South Africa, and uh, then that was transported, manufactured, transported, and distributed throughout the world. We hear more and more about bullying and cyber stalking on a regular basis these days. Some of the things you may not have thought about is suicide, and suicide rates are up by 28% right now. There's obviously things that affect that. That's the economy, people who have not had work, uh, they're losing their homes, they're losing their lives as they see it. Carrying a concealed weapon, a lot of people say, we have a weapons policy. There is no way anybody in our company would be stupid enough to show up with a weapon. Well, you may not think that, but we've had multiple cases, especially in smaller convenience stores, where people are afraid. They're afraid of being robbed, and so they show up with weapons stashed in their purses, backpacks, etc. Gang-related fights are on the increase in particular areas of the country. And a lot of people don't even think of, of having anything to do with that in their policies. One of the other things we're seeing a lot of is sexual assaults, and this one usually surprises people. On any average year, there's approximately 84,000 sexual assaults reported in the workplace. And in the neighborhood of 51,000 rapes are occurring at work. Property damage, assaults, threats are the types of things that we deal with on a regular day-to-day -day basis. And people have a tendency to get a little bit confused about threats. They think if they receive a threat, then they can just contact their, the police department and the police department will come out and actually investigate it. And in most cases, that is not true unless it is actually a direct threat. A direct threat is simply that, something that's really clear and specific such as, I'm going to kill you. We all understand that clear.
clear and specific. The police will investigate that type of threat. What they don't investigate is conditional threats. And a conditional threat is something that depends on your course of action. Something like, fire me. I'll see that you pay for it. Just try to report me. You'll see what happens. The last one that we see a lot of is a veiled threat. It's not as explicit. It would be something along the lines of, I'd better not find you alone on a dark street, or she'll be sorry that she said that. So what I'd like you to do is think of workplace violence in a much broader uh, term. It can be any one of the things that are on here, plus a whole lot more. It can be racism, it can be verbal abuse. I had one situation where a man who was almost ready to turn 65, it was about six, seven months probably before his 65th birthday, he started changing his behavior at work. He was really upset that he was going to be forced into retiring. He didn't want to retire. He wasn't ready to retire, but that was the company policy, that at 65, that's it, he was done. He began to, get, began to become angry. He was explosive at work, um, nervous. And one day, he had asked his assistant to make a phone call. She did, was not able to connect with the person that he wanted. He stormed into her office, said, give me that phone, I'll do it myself was really angry with her, and in grabbing the phone, ended up grabbing a hunk of her hair and literally yanked a huge hunk of hair, leaving a, a, a spot where she was literally bald. Now, everybody in the company had seen this behavior for several months, but it was Joe. He's a nice guy. Nobody wanted to do anything about it. We again get in our way sometimes with judgments about who it can be. It can't be somebody that we love. It couldn't be... Um, you know, somebody in our family. But when it's domestic violence that's involved, it very often is someone who's in the family. It can be employees, it could be a supervisor, it could be a delivery person, a tenant, um, an owner, somebody who's angry, and it could be a complete stranger. So even if you followed every word of advice that I could give you, if I had several days with you, I could give you all of the information that I know, and even if you followed every single thing that I share, it could just be a complete stranger that walks in and causes workplace violence. I want to share with you some of the other most common warning signs that we see. And the thing to keep in mind with these warning signs is it's not just one or two. It's when you see a whole lot of the warning signs put together. That's what elevates the risk. In terms of job performance, it can be dis decreased productivity. It can be frequent absences from their workstation or just absence from their work. Missed due dates. With their attitude, and this is a really big one that I share with people to really watch out for, if you have somebody who is always fun, lively, happy to be with, you know, you want to spend your lunch hour with them because they're always fun, energetic, you know they're going to share a good story, but now they're becoming more withdrawn, they're uncooperative, they're no more fun, they want to be a loner, they want to sit by themselves at lunch, these are all warning signs that there's an issue or a problem. Uh, depression, somebody who becomes belligerent, uh, someone who becomes very uncooperative. We're looking for behaviors that changed. That once they were one way and now they have completely switched. When you start to see someone behaving in a suspicious or a distrustful manner, that's a, a huge warning sign. Somebody who is disoriented periodically. Not necessarily all the time, but just you ask them a question, something that's work-related, something that they should be able to answer off the top of their head with no thought whatsoever, uh, they will get very confused by. Some of the family problems that come with this is drug, alcohol abuse, family problems. Uh, they have very few outside interests. Very often we'll find that the people who commit workplace violence will stay late, come in early for work work weekends, work any overtime, because they just don't have a life outside of work. They may have financial problems, and while you can't use any of these, this personal history or personal life against them, 
it is good when you're doing a risk assessment or you're looking at warning signs. Now some of the red flags that I think that you need to be concerned about are all listed here. Somebody who has a fascination with weapons or a fascination with other violent incidents, if they have news clippings, very often after a serious incident, we'll go in and we'll look at their workspace or their office, their module, wherever they are, and we will see that they have uh, a post-it board where they've posted current events and they all have a tendency to be involved around serious crimes. Sometimes we'll, we'll go through their desk, we'll find magazines uh, for some of these um, uh, Nazi groups and for some of these um, uh, terrorist type groups. Uh, we'll see magazines with weapons uh, in them and not, not the normal gun loving uh, you know, somebody who goes out and shoots for practice, for target practice, or um, as a hobby, uh, you know, hunting, that kind of thing. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the, the off-the-chart, weird kind of magazines that you wouldn't expect to find. That's what we see. You start to see somebody who's acting paranoid in the workplace, and that is a huge red flag. Anger management issues, that's repeated um, over a period of time. Now, I had a uh, new client contact me yesterday with a situation, and he said, you know, I've been to your trainings, Carol, I've seen the warning signs, I've seen the red flags, and I'm a little bit concerned about this particular person. Now, as we talked through and walked through the situation, I certainly understood his reason and area for concern, but I think what he really has is a disgruntled worker who doesn't want to work anymore, wants an easy way out, doesn't quite qualify uh, for retirement quite yet, needs to put in another 18 months or so, and uh, has had anger issues at work. They've all been somewhat mild, if an anger issue can be mild. Um, his have been. People don't like working for him. So there's a, there's a huge long history, but there hasn't been any really noticeable behavior changes other than it looks like he's really frustrated. So I advised him to talk to one or two people very quietly uh, that are close to this person who could uh, perhaps share if there are other any red flags that he needs to know about. So he's very attuned to what's going on, uh, wasn't nervous, just wanted a second opinion. Uh, so this person fit a lot of the warning signs, but not necessarily a lot of the red flags. Violence erupts from people who have problems and they just don't know what to do about those problems. So in your company, think about what holes or gaps that you have that you could fill that would help a person so that they don't get to that place. Reason number two that your people may be in danger is in regards to policies. And you may or may not have a policy. We've worked with a few companies that did have a workplace violence policy in place, but it was so difficult to read and to understand that I read it several times. And even after reading it several times, there was parts of it that I was not clear uh, what it meant. Some companies have a policy that have one or two lines connected with either a harassment policy or a weapons policy. Two lines is not enough. This is a significant topic and a significant issue, and you should have a full policy that's easily read and easily understood. It needs to be grade eight language, very simple. Now, if your company is one who, yes, has a policy, but this policy was written 10 years ago, 12 years ago, maybe even 15 years ago, you might need to look at it and update it. One of the things when workplace violence policies were first put into place that almost everybody used was the term um, zero tolerance. Over the past few years, those of us who are experts in this industry have come to realize that that's really not a good term uh, because it it makes things too difficult for security people and for HR people. If somebody brings just, um, 
you know, a knife because they're going to cut their steak that they brought for lunch to reheat. A steak knife is considered by many to be a weapon. And so, therefore, uh, some companies are just saying, okay, you're done. You violated our workplace violence policy. You need to leave. So by having that zero tolerance type of thinking, it doesn't allow for any sense of um, rational thinking. So we would suggest if you have that in your policy, you remove it. One of the other things that you need to take a look at is do your policies include anything on domestic violence? Some companies have something now on domestic violence. Some have completely separate policies. And that's okay if you choose to have a separate policy. But you need to have something set up to encourage people who have already gotten an order of um, a protection order against a spouse or a significant other, you need to have some method for them to report that to you. And that would be the number one thing, I would say, under policies that is a problem. Even companies who have a policy, they don't have a reporting policy or a tracking system. You want to ensure that you have such a thing when we go in after, uh, when we're consulting with clients or we go in after an event or even sometimes before an incident but they're anticipating that something will go wrong, we start interviewing people. We will normally find anywhere from three to maybe a dozen people who saw something, they heard something, they know that this person's uh, behavior is suspicious, their attitude is a little weird. And when we say to them, why didn't you report it? There's several answers that we get that are common. One is, well, I didn't know it was serious enough to report. Then we also hear, well, who am I supposed to report it to? Do I go to a director of safety? Do I take it to my boss? Am I supposed to take it to my supervisor? Do I have to go to HR? Um, and there's also some fear around there. They don't know. Do I report it by email? Well, what if I say something? Will this guy find out about it? They're unsure about the confidentiality of the company. So when you're creating this reporting system, you want to put a couple of things in place. There should be one or two people, and preferably two people. Uh, it could be your HR person. It could be your director of safety who are responsible for workplace violence files. These files should be kept separate from the personnel files. They should never be mixed or commingled completely separate. And here's the reason why. After an incident we go in and we investigate, we may talk to a number of people. Five different people may tell us something. Each one of those on their own seeming somewhat insignificant or not of great importance. But what happens is if all five of those people had reported to the HR person or to the director of safety, all five of those incidents, it would have become a red flag for the HR person or safety director. They would have said, uh-oh, something is going on here and we need to become involved. There are red flags galore prior to a very serious shooting. The problem is, is that information doesn't get reported to one person. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do. People, when we go in, have bits and pieces of the story. If all those bits and pieces are funneled to one area, collectively, one person could see that it is a problem and an issue. So now we're going to move on to some training issues. The number one thing that we hear a lot of is, you know what? We either don't have the money to do the training or we don't have the time to do the training. This is a must. You must reduce the risk, reduce the liabilities that your companies have, and save money in lawsuits. If there's a workplace violence incident, especially if it is a real serious one, you are going to be paying money. You're going to be writing a check. The difference is how many zeros are on the end of that check. And training is one of the best ways, training and prevention, that you can avoid some of that stuff or at least reduce the dollar amount. 
Workplace violence training is super important, and your supervisor's manager should receive at least a half-day training per year. Your people who are in your threat assessment team, emergency response teams, they need one to two days of training on an annual basis, and in a type of facilitated training where they get to ask their questions and come up with policies, et cetera. Now, your employees themselves, one hour is actually sufficient. The number four reason, number five reason, I can't read my own slides right now, the number five reason that your people could be in danger is prevention. This should seem simple, but we get overwhelmed in our workplace with too many things to be doing. So my one suggestion for you, and if you haven't already filled up your three action items, I would highly suggest you make this one of them, and that is make a list of your gaps or your potential liabilities. Rate what's important. It might be a security assessment or a security audit. When was the last time you did one of those? Uh, how's the lighting in your parking lot? What's your key card access look like? Your front desk personnel, do they know what to do? in emergencies? Have you trained them? Do they have manuals? What about these orders of protection? If someone reports one, what measures do you put in place? Are these listed somewhere? If you're on vacation, do other people have access to this or does it fall apart if you're away? What policies do you have in place for terminations? If you have money handlers, have you developed strategies for them? Do you have threat assessment teams in place? What about a list of resources? I know you all know that you have resources, but most often when I go into a company and I say, show me your list of resources, people look at me with the deer in headlights. They don't have a whole list. I'll say to them, do you have a hazardous disposal team? And they'll look at me strangely. I tell them, that's basically a blood cleanup. If you have a major disaster here, do you know who to call? What are your avenues and what things do you need to be putting in place? What we're hearing from the courts on a regular basis is foreseeable risk. You will get yourself in trouble and put more zeros on the end of that check if you should have seen something coming and you didn't prepare for it. The courts are saying that supervisors and managers are the ones who are supposed to be smart enough to put these things into place. And if not, they should hire someone who knows how to do that.